Hi, welcome to the Bio 181 Tutoring Center videos. Today we're going to be talking about community disturbances and more specifically how they affect species diversity. And then at the very end we're going to touch on other things that affect species diversity besides disturbances such as biogeographic factors. So to start off, what's a disturbance? Well, a disturbance can be things such as fire, a flood, drought, uh, human activity, and basically what it's doing is it's going to affect uh, the number of organisms that live in the community by potentially reducing them um, and reducing the resources that are available. So previously, ecologists uh, kind of believed that communities uh, were in equilibrium, they were pretty constant, um, and they didn't have to go undergo a lot of these changes. However, as we continue to observe communities, we've started to follow this uh, non-equilibrium model more, um, that communities are constantly undergoing changes because they're constantly being faced with disturbances. And so some of those disturbances that communities can be um, faced with uh, seasonally from year to year um, is things like storms. Those affect both terrestrial and aquatic um, communities because storms can generate waves which will then affect aquatic communities. Uh, other things are periodical freezing of lakes and rivers um, and so that will affect the step in the lake and the river and then also if there's some sort of flooding going on as well that can affect the areas around. And then fires is a big one for terrestrial uh, environments and communities because that can drastically alter the organisms and the resources available. And in fact, a lot of biomes, as if you remember, um, uh, we talk about biomes actually require seasonal fires in order for growth to continue. So that brings us to this idea of the intermediate disturbance hypothesis. And this uh, hypothesis says that modern levels of disturbance allow for the greatest species diversity. And so why is that? Why is it that when we have moderate levels of a disturbance, so we have moderate levels of intensity, moderate levels of frequency, so we have disturbances now and again, why is that allowing the greatest species diversity? Because logically it makes sense that if you have high disturbance, then it's going to affect species diversity because you're going to be uh, killing off a lot of the uh, species because they won't be able to handle the stress of this environment. And so you'd expect um, with uh, high levels of disturbance that we'd have lower species diversity. But why with uh, low levels of dis uh, disturbance we also not have this great species diversity? And the reason is because when you have low disturbance you allow for um, these dominant species to arise, species that have um, some sort of uh, ecological or evolutionary advantage over other species. And so they'll become more prominent uh, in your community and they'll kind of outweigh all of the species that aren't as adapted. And so remember species diversity is based on richness and abundance. So if we don't have a lot of species or there's just a lot of one type, then we don't have a lot of species diversity. And so by having these periodical disturbances, what we're doing is we're messing with these dominant species um, and we might be wiping some of them out and opening up um, some a habitat for those species that are less um, suited for their environment or able to compete with those dominant species. So just remember that the intermediate disturbance hypothesis is like it sounds. Intermediate disturbance allows for the greatest species diversity and understand why. Um, now we're going to move on to talking about ecological succession. So ecological succession, succession deals with what happens when we do have a disturbance and how um, the community recovers and the different species that come in and replace uh, old species one after another as we're recovering. So there's two types that we talk about. The first is primary succession. And primary succession happens when we have no soil to begin with. So make sure you uh, know that distinction. And so these are things like volcanic volcanoes, uh, the uh, magma can cover an area and so now we have no soil left, um, or we have glaciers that recede and when they recede all that's left is um, rock um, and so that's not soil either. And so what happens is we just kind of start off and we have some prokaryotic, heterotrophic and um, autotrophic that are living um, around the area um, and they'll start to kind of provide a little bit of uh, nutrients and then we'll have some lichen and moss that will be uh, blown in by spores and those will start to develop and over time what's going to happen is we're going to be breaking up this rock by erosion so we're going to be having soil and then there's going to be nutrients put back in um, as some of these things start to decompose um, and over time we're going to start to develop soil and as we develop soil we'll allow for grass and shrubs and trees to come in and then uh, they might replace each other uh, in succession depending on what they are. 
Secondary succession, on the other hand, deals with uh, places where soil is already present. So what happened, the disturbance was something that just cleared off uh, the top kind of layer of the species, the plants and uh, some of the animals and things, but it didn't get rid of the soil. So that's things like fires, or if we cleared an area for farming and then we abandoned it later, uh, maybe the soil's not, the soil's there, but there's nothing growing on top of it. And so whereas this one's kind of starting um, from scratch, this one already has something to work with. We just have to put something back in there. Um, and so the, the different species that will come in, they can have different interactions with the future species that will come in. They can either facilitate, inhibit, or tolerate uh, the next species that come in. So if they facilitate it, they're going to uh, do something uh, to the environment that allows for another species to come into the community. If they inhibit it, they're going to uh, prevent other species from coming to the community, but they'll eventually be able to overcome those things they are inhibiting them. Or they'll tolerate them, they're, they're going to be independent of the new uh, succeeding uh, species that come in. Um, and so we've actually seen this um, in real life. Um, an example is in Glacier Bay. So in Alaska we have some glaciers that are receding and as they're receding we're able to uh, see the changes in the communities and the species that live there uh, over time. So we saw uh, at the beginning uh, some fire weeds or so some kind of smaller uh, plants. So we assume that first of course we had to develop our soil but then we have some smaller like uh, moss lichen type uh, shrub things that are called fireweed and then as we continue over time they uh, became dominant by dryas which is a, a bigger uh, type of uh, shrub and then as we continue to go back we started to get some alders which was a smaller tree come into the area and then finally we had spruce which is a, a bigger tree so what this did was over time we had this ecological succession of different species come into the area. So that's uh, disturbances. And then lastly, we got to talk about human disturbances because humans um, are kind of one of the biggest impact on uh, communities. Um, we impact them every day of our lives. Um, and one of the big things we can do is with agriculture, as we clear land for farming or for grazing of our animals, we're pretty much wiping out uh, whole communities and really reducing species diversity. Um, and it's not just happening in the United States, we're not the only culprits, there's areas um, and a lot of tropical rainforests that are just being cut down and there's a lot of species diversity in there and as we destroy their habitats um, and a lot of their resources then we're, we're killing them off. Um, so that's kind of a problem. Um, and it's not just happening on terrestrial areas, it also happens in the ocean with this thing called ocean trawling. So we'll have a weighted down nets uh, being pulled by boats and the object is to catch fish, um, you know, for food and things. But in the process, as they drag those nets down, uh, they actually kind of uh, plow out a lot of the stuff at the bottom of the seafloor, and that can be coral reefs a lot of times. And so they'll kind of uh, desolate these coral reefs that have a lot of species diversity as well. And so when they do that, then they um, kind of destroy a lot of resources and habitats that different species needed that lived in that area. So we've kind of been uh, having a big impact on uh, species diversity in a variety of communities. So that's uh, disturbances. Now we're going to move in and talk about how biogeographic factors also can affect species diversity. So uh, these are kind of um, small local things that will affect it. These are kind of big general uh, things that affect species diversity. So biogeographic uh, talks about kind of its location. So the first one is latitudinal gradients. So based on the latitude that we're at, we're going to have different species diversity. And we've seen that when we talk about our biomes. Um, places that are near the equator tend to have a lot more species than places that are at the poles. And that's for two main reasons, uh, because of the evolutionary history and because of the climate. So places that are near the uh, equator, they have longer growing seasons because uh, they have more sunlight and they're not in winter all the time, like places at the poles. So because they have longer growing seasons, they have more time um, for evolution to occur. Um, and so we have more uh, chances for speciation events to occur um, to allow for more species. There are places at the pole, they're not in their growing season a lot, and so there's less uh, chance for these evolutionary and speciation events to occur. I'm sorry. <clears throat> but even more so than that is uh, climate. So we know that at the poles we have uh, more precipitation and more sunlight. And that allows uh, for more organisms to thrive and more different species to thrive. And one way that we look at this is with evapotranspiration. So that looks at how much water uh, we are uh, sucking out of the soil and then how much of it is being transpired back into the atmosphere. 
And we've noticed a positive correlation with places that have higher rates of evapotranspiration. They also have um, higher species diversity. So just know that trend, because most likely if you're asking something like this on a test, it's going to be asking you to look at some sort of graph and interpret it. And so just know that generally we have higher evapotranspiration, we're going to have higher species diversity. And then the other thing that can uh, affect species diversity that has to do with biogeographical factors is the area. So generally, if all factors are the same, the larger the area um, where communities are residing, we tend to find more species. Um, and that's just uh, been proven with different experiments and things. And then finally, uh, this kind of goes into the island equilibrium model and how that also can affect uh, the species diversity. But I'm not going to talk about in this video. Uh, there's another video that you can look for on the Engineering Center website that will go into more detail about the specifics of the island equilibrium model. But just know that it's kind of under this uh, species diversity with biogeographical factors. Um, so that's going to be it for today's video. I hope it was helpful. I hope you have an understanding, better understanding of uh, these disturbance ideas, especially the intermediate disturbance hypothesis in primary and secondary succession. Remember the main difference is one starts with no soil and one starts with soil. Um, um, and so yeah, that's it. Uh, thank you again for watching and have a fantastic day.